Hello, all you beautiful people. Thank you so much for joining us for this third and final episode of our Fall 2020 Learning to Listen Conversations for Change webinar series. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm Joshua Sparrow, Executive Director of the Brazelton Touchpoint Center, where you can find webinar series on family engagement, mental health for all of us during COVID-19 times, and so many others, including more Learning to Listen Conversations for Change. The recordings from this year and last year are there at brazeltontouchpoints.org and will be coming back in 2021 for more Conversations for Change. So again, uh, you can find uh, these webinars and information about upcoming ones on the brazeltontouchpoints.org website and just click on the webinars tab. We are so fortunate today to have as our featured speaker, my good friend and teacher, Hassan Daniel. And he actually um, has been kind enough to uh, join us in person to answer your questions after uh, we uh, air for the very first time, the conversation that Hassan and I recorded back in January of this year before our world changed in so many ways. Uh, but before uh, we uh, show you the premiere, um, and then we will be back for questions, so um, enter them into the um, question and answer box. Let me tell you a little bit about our housekeeping and technical details. First, uh, we have close to 1,400 people registered for today's webinar, which is amazing. But if you have difficulty viewing the webinar in Zoom, you can watch it live on our Facebook page. All you have to do is search for the Brazelton Touchpoint Center in Facebook, and then you'll see the live stream video pinned to the top of our page. For today's webinar, we have Spanish translation by our superb interpreter, Maria Jose Gutierrez, who is joining us as always, all the way from Bogota, Colombia. Thank you so much, Maria Jose. To access the translation, click on the interpretation icon in your Zoom controls at the bottom of your screen. Then just select Spanish and to mute the English in the background, select mute original audio. La conversación de hoy será en español e inglés. En los controles de esa reunión, haga clic en interpretación, haga clic en el idioma que le gustaría escuchar. Para escuchar solo el español, haga clic en silenciar audio original. Today's webinar includes a chat box and a Q&A box. Probably a lot of us are getting used to that. So um, as always, please use the chat feature if you have a comment to share and choose all panelists or choose all panelists and attendees. If you have a specific question for uh, Hassan, uh, please enter your question into the Q&A box and we'll come back, as I said, at about 3.35 Eastern time, 12.35 Pacific, right after our uh, conversation, which runs a, a little bit more than 30 minutes. Now, tomorrow you'll receive a thank you email with a link to the recording of today's webinar and a link to our feedback survey. You can also access the recording on our YouTube channel and our website, that's brazeltontouchpoints.org. Please do complete the feedback survey so that we can send you a certificate of attendance and we always want to know what you think. If you are having a technical problem, you can let us know by selecting panelists in the chat and tell us what's going on, or you can email Kayla Savelli and Kayla's email address will be posted in the chat. Now, before we begin, I want to be sure to thank our sponsor, the Burke Foundation, without whom this would not be possible, and our fabulous uh, Brazelton Touchpoint Center production team, Kayla Savelli, Ashley Gaddis, and Michael Accardi, and our friends at Santa Monica Studios, where this conversation was filmed and edited. And of course, I want to thank again our expert for the fascinating conversation we're about to watch. And as I said, who has um, volunteered, actually I asked him and he said yes, to uh, join us again today to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Hassan Daniel, for your strength and courage and for the hope and clarity you've given so many of us. You'll find out more about Hassan in just a moment when we um, show you our conversation. So let's go. Learning to Listen, TV show and podcast series, Conversations for Change. Presented by the Brazelton Touchpoint Center. 
hosted by Joshua Sparrow. Dr. Sparrow is a child psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School, the author of nine parenting books, and is the executive director of the Brazelton Touchpoint Center. The center was founded by T. Barry Brazelton, who was one of the most influential doctors in pediatrics and child development of the 20th century. Conversations for Change, opening your eyes for new voices on parenting. Brought to you by the Burke Foundation. This is Learning to Listen, Conversations for Change. And I'm Joshua Sparrow from the Brazelton Touchpoint Center. In this episode, we're joined by Hassan Daniel. Hassan Daniel is the founder and CEO of The Father Factory, a counseling program for fathers who have experienced childhood trauma like molestation and physical and mental abuse. Hassan is a board-certified marriage and family therapist and author of the book, Where is the Man of the House? He is also a dedicated father of two sons and has a degree in Christian counseling. Hey, Hassan, thank you so much for joining us. Let's start by learning about the Father Factory, your baby, your work. Tell us, what made you get started with this and what are you doing there? Well, thank you, Josh. I'm honored to be here to celebrate the legacy of Dr. T. Berry Browselton and your legacy as well. You guys are amazing and you have uh, changed this world uh, for so many children, so thank you. So, the Father Factory is a coaching service for males um, and we're addressing intergenerational impacts of childhood sexual violence in men for those that are now parenting. And so we're looking at this idea of what impact your life, um, this particular trauma of child sexual violence, and now how you are managing the impact of those triggers as you are parenting this next generation. And we're also, we're looking at the intergenerational part of it because what I understand is that it didn't start in just one generation. Uh, someone was silent about their experience and unfortunately allowed another experience to take place. So if it's okay, Hassan, can you talk to us about why you got involved in this? Well, the numbers around this is this. Uh, the statistics say that there's one in every six boys and one in every three girls uh, that have been molested before the age of 18. And I'm one of the six boys. And uh, my experience um, is an experience that I had to deal with for many years and haven't, after many years, spoke up and talked about it. Uh, I've yet to tell my full story, but uh, this particular impact that it has had on me, I know that others have experienced it and uh, need help in this area. So we're here. We're here to advocate for those that have gone through these experiences and are now trying to make it better for the next generation. So you talked about the many years during which you were silent. What happened during those years? During those years, uh, there was a lot of processing. You're asking the question, why? Uh, you're wondering uh, why people may have failed you. Uh, there's a lot of transitions that happen. They said every 10 years, you're a different person. And uh, you begin to ask different questions or ask them in different variations. And when you begin to get the answers for them, they are the things that wake you up in life, uh, make you think about what the future of our world is if uh, we stay silent around this, around this subject. We need to address it. So you said one of the questions that you asked yourself while you were silent was, why did people fail me? How do you answer that question? Yeah, what I've learned to say is that a lot of the failure that I've had in my life was unintentional. Uh, sometimes we're so blinded by our own trauma and what we're experiencing that we're not listening to our children. This is why I love what you guys are doing and have been doing for many years because it's been telling the world that we need to slow down and listen to what children are saying. So. I guess that gets us to ask, what, what do you wish could have happened 
during those years when you couldn't tell anybody when you were silent? What kind of help do you wish you could have that you didn't get? For me and for all have that have experienced this, that there was an unconditional love that said, uh, this is not your fault. Uh, we could have done better to support you and protect you. Uh, and it, it would have gone a step further to think about what laws need to be in place that help uh, deal with this issue. And that it was looked at in a systemic uh, manner, right? So that we're looking at it, say, what are our governments doing? What are our communities doing? What are our families doing? And then dealing with it as a village so that the children that we're raising are ready to raise the next generation. So you talked a little bit about wishing that parents would be able to slow down and to listen. What, what should parents be listening for? What kinds of signs should they be watching for that might tell them something happened that their child feels they have to be silent about and can't talk about? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, I talk often about this idea of intentional parenting. And intentional parent has this idea of paying attention to the details of your life, right? So I'm noticing uh, the, the variations of change that happen in you, right? From infancy all the way through because I'm watching your life. We say in the, in the church world that um, a great father is one that is able to prophesy to the life of that child when they are going on in their future, so they actually can tell them that these, this is what your future will look like because I've been studying your life. And if parents are stopping a moment to study their children, because everyone won't speak like everyone else, um, I think what tends to happen and one of the questions that we ask is why are people silent about this? Uh, and my take on it is that they're not silent that they've been screaming out really loud in behavioral um, and, and mood changes and uh, f their, their physical um, safety. A number of things were uh, telling us this. Um, one of the great things that we learned from you and Dr. B, uh, which we affectionately call him, um, is this idea of when a child gets to a place of wailing and crying, that's probably their last sign of telling you that they're hungry. There were tons of signs just before that. And uh, if we don't put everyone in a cookie cutter and try to say, you're supposed to say this and say it this way, we could actually hear so much more. We would open the world to true color. We would open the world to true imagination. So Hassan, if, if it's okay, I'm wondering if you could talk about the silent screaming that you were doing while this was happening to you that no one understood, that no one heard. What, what, did, it, what did it look like? What would people have seen had they known what to look for? Yeah. So uh, growing up for me, I grew up in the Brownsville Projects in Brooklyn. Uh, these are some of the most infinite, infamous streets uh, in New York. And so, you know, there's the gang violence, there's the drug world. Um, I was not a part of any of that, but I was very introverted. Uh, so uh, very uh, ultra sensitive to uh, being screamed at or getting a spanking. And, and wanted to make sure that I was the goody two-shoes, right? Uh, to, to extents where I was self-sacrificing. Self-sacrificing and it manifests in my household as being the perfect child, but it manifests in school as being uh, the class clown, wanting to please everyone. So I didn't want to rock the boat. And I saw that that became a big issue for me as years can continue to go in my life because it took a fight out of me to stand up for what I believe was right. Um, and I had to reclaim that. And so parents want to look out for uh, those changes in their children, 
Um, how how often are you talking to your child about those things that might seem taboo? Have you created an environment that said it's safe to talk and express yourself, even if it goes against what I think is right? I still want to hear your voice. So what do you, what do you actually do as a parent to create that environment of safety? And what would you say to your child if you thought you were seeing signs that you knew the child wasn't able to speak openly to? Yeah. Unconditional love matters. It matters that uh, there's a scripture that talks about how many times should I forgive my brother? And, you know, the person asking the question was like, well, should I forgive them seven times? And in reply, uh, Jesus says, no, you should forgive them 70 times, 77 um, in a day. And when you do the math, you're like, hold on, 490 times in one day I should forgive my brother? But the, what he was translating was this idea that there's no wrong you can do that I won't love you through. Parents need to be in that place. I will love you through every wrong. I love you through anything that you've interpreted to be wrong, and I'm there for you. That's important for a child to feel and to experience, um, and oftentimes it's this opportunity for them to speak out. But I'll also say this. I, I don't want to put it totally on a parent to say, if you do all of that, this won't happen to your child. We should really know that this is a social justice issue and that there is a big uh, issue around this. There's a group that has a saying that says um, sex before eight or it's too late. When you have societies like that that believe in uh, pedophilia, uh, where, where are we living and how safe is this world for us? So we really do need to think about how pedophiles groom, how... Um, uh, lax we are on laws around protecting children and giving children voice. So let's talk a little bit about pedophiles grooming because often it's really subtle and there's even some things that happen that seem like they're good things for the child or the family. So let's talk a little bit about like how that actually works. So unfortunately, they are master manipulators. So they study you, they study the child. So they don't just groom the child, they start off with grooming the caregivers. They're looking at the people around the child that could open up the door for them to have access. And so I was talking about this the other day and I mentioned, I said, you know, not that this is criminal and we're, I'm saying that it is wrong, but grandparents tend to go a step over what parents have laid down as a law, probably out of spite to say, I'm going to get you back for when you were a child and <laughs> you did what you did. Um, but they will do stuff like, I'm going to sneak you some candy or I'll let you have that ice cream that your parents said you can't have. Um, but the community should really think about what that means and how that interprets for a child that uh, we can have small secrets over here aside from your caregivers. And that makes children susceptible to a number of um, pedophiles that groom. So we should really think about this. So do, you, so do you think that some children or families have vulnerabilities that pedophiles pick up on that are part of why they choose where they're gonna move in? I absolutely believe that. Um, broken homes are definitely um, a target. Uh, homes where children aren't able or seemingly aren't able to speak to their parents. And then this person comes along as the, the hope, right? And you can talk to me and, and confide in me. Uh, for me, it was definitely just that. I grew up without my father in my life. Uh, I wrote a book in 2000 that in, was entitled, Where is the Man of the House? And I talked about my experience of not having my dad in my life. Um, and this particular person that uh, groomed me and violated uh, became this father figure. 
and a father figure for many people in the community. Uh, so for parents to kind of release their children to this individual was very easy. Um, and on top of that, this person was a minister. It was a pastor. And so the trust that is confided in that, um, in the hands of a person like that, is very dangerous. And so children being open in that way. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about the specific kind of harm that happens in that kind of situation, which is fairly common, where an adult who is supposed to be in a caregiver role exploits the trust to uh, sexually abuse the child. Uh, wh what kind of damage happens to the child when that person was in a position of, of caregiving? And, and violated that trust? Yeah. First, and that's a great question. Um, we should know that if a child is going to be groomed and mostly pedophiles are people that the children know and that the parents confide in and have opened up a circle to, uh, the majority of violators are those people. Uh, that's not to say to watch every family member but I do think it means to be on the same page in terms of um, parents set rules and everyone obey those rules. And we redirect children back to rules. Uh, but the damage that comes from that is insecurity, right? So who do I trust? Who do I trust? Who do I extend my love to, right? Which could mean uh, going through... Uh, you know, teenage years, uh, dating, getting married, and deciding, like, can I trust you with my heart? Because I've been down this road and I experienced this trauma. Uh, so we definitely can see that there's a, a lot of hurt. Uh, when I speak to men about hurt, I talk about the other side of hurt, which is anger, right? Right, so... Uh, if you're telling me you're angry about this, I'm turning it back and saying, so who hurt you? What, where, was, where did that hurt come from? Um, there's a lot of hurt in experiencing that because you don't know who to trust. You don't know. Um, it kind of redefines you and calls you uh, differently. And so if there's no help, uh, in the near future, oftentimes people are falling into uh, to some deep um, pain in their in their soul. So one of the one of the things to be angry about is, I thought this person was someone who was supposed to take care of me, someone who was supposed to trust. What are the other things that there are to be angry about? As the flip side of the hurt. Yeah. Yeah. So. You're supposed to take care of me. You're supposed to be the person uh, that's there, uh, that loves me. Um, for me, as I think about it, um, and I want to make this quick disclaimer. It's like uh, those that have experienced uh, child sexual violence, um, tell your story as you are comfortable with selling it, right? Um, when you release your story, uh, you want to do the work to guard yourself of what comes up in you. Uh, and so I just want to say that for those that are listening. But for me particularly, uh, the, the number of things that happen is that you question manhood, right? Um, so what does this mean about me? Uh, am I capable? If I, am I not capable? Will I? Am I able to be loved? Maybe it was my fault. Maybe I did something that I shouldn't have done. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, because no one's running to my rescue, uh, maybe this is supposed to happen to me. Um, yeah, it gets really intense. Uh, for a number of people that have experienced uh, this trauma. So Hassan, you talked about one of the things to be angry about. What are the other things to be angry about that are the flip side of the pain? 
how it challenges you. It challenges you on a number of levels, uh, intellectually. I, I, what's wrong with you? Are you stupid? Something's wrong with you. Why, why, did, why did this happen to you? And then there's this spiritual side, right? How does God see me? How will I be forgiven for this? It, do I wear this shame and this guilt around? Somebody sees this written all over my face. Um, and that emotional part of it uh, that says, were you man enough? Were you strong enough? And uh, why didn't you, uh, why weren't you able to defend yourself? We fast forward to fatherhood with a man who grew up having experienced childhood sexual violence. And what are the kinds of things that are hard and in what ways for men as they become fathers and as their children grow? This is a great question because this is the work of the father factory. It's to really look at those uh, small adjustments that need to be made. I think a lot of times there's a lot of assumptions around what men are going through because they had this experience, but sometimes it's indecisiveness, right? I'm unable to make up my mind around this because I don't trust that I'm smart enough, that I'm capable enough, um, that I'm purposeful. Like, you know, do, do any, does anyone hear me? You know, do they see me? Can they feel me? Uh, so those things come up in adulthood. And adulthood also is this, what I've seen in our society, is this immense and intense shame for men to talk about this. Uh, this is the work that I like to do because we need to normalize the fact that men hurt. When we can get that, we can hear the little boy in us. We can hear the child in all of us that have ever experienced uh, child sexual violations. Um, we could do some amazing work. Um, I have found my journey is staying present. That's big for me, right? Staying present in this moment, right? Because in a moment of that trauma, for me, it was going somewhere else in my head. And, you know, learning to not live in my head, right? Go off into daydreaming or, um, you know, escaping pain, uh, but actually getting to a place where I can be present to actually deal with uh, what comes up for me, to actually be present for my children, for my beautiful wife, uh, and to see that I'm enjoying day by day and not uh, lamenting over this past that I've experienced. So Hassan, how did, how did you get from where you were when you couldn't tell anybody to where you are now, now that you can tell your story, now that you want to share your story and share it with other men to help them heal? How, how did that happen? My story, uh, it, is packaged around a number of other stories. So for me to tell my full story uh, kind of puts a number of people story out. So I'll speak from my perspective, but what gave me the courage was to find out that I was not the only victim. And it became uh, those that were younger and younger and younger. And that striked a boldness in me to speak out. I actually confronted uh, my uh, perpetrator and um, I actually went to the police to file a report uh, and made it very vocal of this taking place. I've got a lot of uh, backlash for it uh, because again, this was a person that is, this is a person uh, that is loved and trusted by a lot of people um, and has that authority. Uh, so, you know, a lot of what I've gotten from that was, well, why didn't you say anything? The very typical things. 
Um, and I could very well turn around and say, why weren't you listening? All right. Uh, so, yeah, that's where we are with that. So a, a lot of people who've experienced childhood sexual violence find that it is healing to go through the process of confronting the perpetrator and pursuing them in court legally. There are others who decide for a variety of reasons, often because they feel like they will not be listened to, uh, they will not be believed, who choose not to put themselves through that. So for those people, do you see that as a necessary part of healing or are there other paths to healing if that's been a person's decision to not go there? Well, there's two things for that for me. One, the, um, I don't subscribe to the idea of healing. I subscribe more to this thing of managing on a day-to-day -day basis and living out what you have experienced. I think when we, in our society today, when we think about healing, we think of miracle and it's all gone and nothing's, no problems anymore. And, um, and that is not the case. This is something that you will live out. Um, the, the bigger issue, I think, that's here is that not the idea of confronting the person uh, that uh, was the perpetrator, but to confront you, right? Because it's about managing you. Uh, the experience happened and it is unfortunate and we uh, wished and prayed that we would have had other things in place so that we could have protected you. Uh, but now uh, you have this power to reorganize you and to structure you in such a way that uh, as things come up for you, you can, number one, name it, identify the triggers and how they come up in your life, and then find skillful ways of actually managing them. And I think uh, that's if we want to say the word healing, is on the way to that place. Uh, but if, I think it's almost like walking and it becoming a lighter and an easier walk. You start out jogging and it's really hard because you're out of shape, uh, but you keep at it. It gets easier and easier, but it's still work to do. So that's my idea of uh, working through uh, this because you're going to experience this at different levels and different stages of your life. Um, and there's no one answer at one stage. So, so for children who have experienced sexual violence, who are asking the questions about themselves, what do you wish um, they could have and hold on to as answers to those questions? Definitely that it is not their fault. They did nothing wrong. Uh, there was nothing wrong that they did. That is a message that we have to say very loud and very clear. Um, what they can definitely hold on to is a promising future because they will now uh, have experienced this and now begin to uh, redefine it. Um, put it in categories that allow them to work through um, any tough areas. And by that, I mean, like, specifically, like, um, I, my trust was violated. And what does that mean for the future? There will be other times where there are people that you cannot trust, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that was the situation you experienced. Right When we can separate it and then actually deal with it as is, I think we are at a, um, a healthier place. So I really want to see dads get to a place. I want to see families get to a place where they're able to sustain great opportunities. I don't think we need opportunities. Opportunities are always there. Um, to grow and to learn who we are, but I want to. I'm interested in: Are we ready to sustain those opportunities that come our way? Um, when you're dealing with hurt in the way that um, uh, millions of people do, which is stuffing, um, you oftentimes are blinded by the other side of um, this 
really gracious and, um, and, and worthy place for life. Thank you so much, Hassan. Your courage and your commitment to this work is truly an inspiration for all of us. And thank you, all of you have tuned in to Learning to Listen Conversations for Change. Deep breaths. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Hassan. Wow. <laughs> I've already watched that many times, but um, <laughs> um, just got to yeah. take some deep breaths here. And um, looking at the comments and questions in the chat, um, it really looks like this is something we needed to be talking about and that we need to be talking about. Um, I just wanted to make sure you saw um, one of them said, you are so incredibly brave, Hassan. Thank you for doing this work and being so open and vulnerable. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, let me start by saying hola, um, bonjour, and hello to everyone out there. Um, I'm excited to uh, be with you guys today. This is uh, a very important work and thank you for the person that gave that comment. Um, and I'm, let's, let's go, let's talk. <laughs> so um, I just want to say someone else says, Hassan, you are so brave and inspiring. You are a gift to this world. Thank you. I agree with that. Thank yeah. you, thank you. <laughs> thank thank you, you for sharing your story and making change of so many lives you have set someone free to feel they are not alone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, very brave and inspiring for others. Someone wanted to know how old you were when you um, confronted the person who abused you. I don't know if you're comfortable saying that, but sure. I um, You know, uh, it, that is a, a great question, really because it actually lends to what happens to uh, victims and survivors that an average there's a 20 years, 20 years before they disclose that something actually took place. I was actually reading uh, a number of the questions that people were uh, sending in, and a lot of people were asking about the book. But the, during the time of writing the book, I still had not spoken about the fact that I had gone through uh, sexual abuse. Um, it was some time after that. So uh, I want to say sometime um, early 2000s um, that um, this conversation actually came about and um, the bravery actually to speak out and reference this. But that that's exactly um, what happens, this, this time of um, uh, disclosure because there's this shame that's around uh, having experienced this. And I, I just want to connect a, some data for all of those people that are listening. There's an average of 20 years of disclosure for the person who has experienced uh, molestation. And on average, the pedophile in a lifetime of um, committing this violent act will um, uh, molest, violate a hundred to 100, 150 to 200 boys and uh, 200 to 300 girls before he or she is first arrested. And if you put those two, that data together, you see that the silence on the side of the victim actually in ways lend to this furthering the, um, the pedophile to continue in the work. And so um, I talk about this, you know, the victim's responsibility in this and, um, and 
and not just the victim's responsibility, but everyone around us, that we have to look at the responsibility um, systemically. So you're saying part of, and again, I, I want to really respect what you're okay with talking about and not. Um, you're my uh, friend, we're good. <laughs> yeah, all right, well, you let me know, I'm counting on that. But you're saying part of what um, got you to the point of deciding to tell your story was you felt like I need to stop um, this from happening to more um, children who this person might get to. Yeah, I actually uh, hadn't named it. I hadn't called it molestation. I had, you know, it was something you're going through and you kind of just bury it and you don't even really want to kind of deal with it. And then when you start dealing with it, and I actually remember talking to a friend in reference to it, and he he said for the first time in my ears, me hearing it, it was like, you were molested. And it blew me away. I, like, I, I, I was like, that's what happened, right? Like, you, it, it, it's uh, amazing of, um, you know, how this society really sets you up in a way where, uh, one, men should not hurt, men can't cry, right? Um, so that you don't really get to even experience the emotion or the impact of it until you kind of shaken up. Yeah. You know, you know, when you say that, Hassan, it it um it makes me um, want to ask you about uh, identity. You know, because yeah. when you say it blew me away to hear you were molested, and that wasn't really the language you were using in your conversations with yourself. Um, is part of the reason why it's so hard to finally say the words because there's a struggle with what does this mean about my identity, about who I am, how I define myself, how others define me? Yeah, I, as I said in the video, you know, I grew up in Brownsville, Brooklyn. You know, I grew up in Brownsville projects. This is not a conversation that you have. This is not, you know, you did, you, you are, you are uh, probably saying all the mean things about conversations around this. Um, so this, that was not an environment to actually uh, disclose to or to talk to. Um, so yeah, there was a lot that would, would hinder the ability to actually talk about this. Yeah. So um, one, there was one question, which I think, you know, maybe fits with what you were saying about the 20 year gap. And I should note there there are some comments in the chat about so with um, the Boy Scout lawsuits, if there were eighty thousand uh, people who um, have filed claims, it means there may be a hundred or two hundred times more. And yeah, that's that's the implication. But one of the earlier questions, which may have to do with this twenty year gap between um, saying something, is a uh, is it commonplace for adult men to have memory gaps in their history? but just have a feeling of something bad having happened. Absolutely. A number of uh, people that have counsel have actually said that, that they have gotten uh, clear into, uh, you know, adulthood and remembered what actually happened, something triggered, uh, and they could not believe that they had stuffed that and, and buried that so deep down inside, but they always, sensed that something wasn't right, something um, didn't feel uh, right. But when that connection was made to trigger, they were able to now remember details of what actually happened to them. So um, th there, was, there was a question uh, also about, um, uh, you know, what, what, what I think really what, what kind of hope there can be, and I think you touched on this in our um, conversation when you talked about how at first it's, you know, you're running real hard and then you slow down to a walk, but it's, it's always work. Um, and, and the question was, if a man has been in, in, in this ordeal, do the walls ever come down um, so that um, there can be a moving forward? <clears throat> yeah, and I think, um, you know, there are variations of moving forward, what that means for different people. You know, the thing to remember about uh, trauma is that it is um, deeply distressing and, um, you know, disturbing experience that an individual will have. And in most ways that it, it, it does some impairments to us psychologically, it does some impairments spiritually. 
Um, and, and that's the part of it that needs to be managed because in the long term, without having dealt with that, what can be experiences, the work of what we're seeing now is adverse childhood experiences, cases where we're seeing um, long-term effects on the physical um, um, beings of individuals, so such as men um, and people that are, have long-term uh, trauma that they haven't managed um, are experiencing ailments, um, diabetes and hypertension and a number of different uh, things that are manifesting physically. Um, and they're even uh, making some connections with cancer as well. Um, and that, that's not to say everyone that has any of those elements have been molested, but it is to, uh, to speak to the long-term effects that trauma has, not only on your uh, emotions and your, your spiritual being, but on your physical being as well. So, um, you know, another one of the effects, which is really at the center of your work is uh, being a father. And there were there are a couple of fairly specific questions about that, and you know if we can take them in the context of well, what kind of work um, can one do as a father who's been through this in childhood um, to be able to be freer to be the father one wants to be? So one of the questions was, what sorts of behaviors in children can be triggering for fathers who had childhood experiences of sexual abuse? And a related one is how can we encourage fathers who experience this kind of trauma to not live in fear that their children will experience the same, to protect them, but not overprotect them? Yeah, yeah. So on a personal note for me, you know, with managing uh, the experience that I had in raising uh, my two wonderful sons, uh, one of my, uh, well, both of my children, we, we raised them, my wife and I raised them in a way where they can, you know, vocalize how they feel about something. They can disagree with us and explain how they, what they feel about that. They have voice, they have, uh, we don't overstep boundaries for them. We give them space so that they know when someone does, that's what's wrong. When someone invades their, their boundaries and goes against um, the very thing that they hold to be respectful. But um, I found myself even uh, kind of struggling at first as we are rolling this work out and thinking about touch points and uh, doing the great work with um, interface with our children that I was um, um, kind of flashing back to me not having that liberty to speak out and speak up against what was wrong and what was um, what I didn't like and what um, I didn't want to do or anything like that. And that that um, looking at that at times there's this great joy that comes that they have this ability to do it. And other times I'm um, kind of just you know shaking up that um, there was a time that I could not do that. So there is this um, this wrestling that definitely happens. If you could just uh, repeat that second part of the question. Um, then I'll address that. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah. Um, there, there is the the question. I mean, I think you, you've really got it. It's really, are there specific behaviors in children that can be triggering for fathers? And you know, how can fathers who've been through this um, not live in fear that their children are going to go through this and not overprotect yeah. while protecting? Yeah. You know, living in fear about uh, something that you've experienced and that you don't want your child to experience is always something for any parent that has have experienced uh, things. And even those that haven't directly experienced childhood trauma, you just don't want to see this happen for your child. But what I'd like all of us to do is to understand that this is not, this is a work that everyone has to be involved in. We have to look at this work systemically. We have to understand that there were so many different things in play that allowed for this environment to take place. And then, and, and then it fed into that environment that allowed or, or pushed victims to stay silent. So the, the work really is around and we'll remove the fear out of raising our children when we start thinking about the idea of raising them in this village, right? And that everyone is paying attention 
you know, I absolutely love the, the, you know, the topic of this webinar, which is learning to listen, right? Listening to children, right? This idea of um, it, when we're paying attention in such a way um, that we get this opportunity for, um, we don't give the opportunity for things like this to take place. Unfortunately, um, because of being master manipulators, um, pedophiles, they are constantly looking for ends. They're looking for ways uh, to to creep in. But the the village, the, the parents that are uh, really being intentional about um, creating an environment that their child can know the difference in, uh, can more likely rest assured knowing that their child is on this way of uh, being able to disclose anything that doesn't. Um, lend to that child's consent. So that that um, gets us to this question about boys in particular. I, there's been a lot of appreciation for the focus on boys um, uh, because this isn't a topic that gets talked about very much. And you know, I guess we have to wonder why um, and whether or not the, the not even talking about it is related to whether or not um, there are differences in the way we raise boys um, from the way we raise girls that may make it harder for boys to disclose sexual abuse. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, cultural norms, like um, we need to do work around masculinity. We need to really look at masculinity. I um, interview a gentleman on my podcast of Voice Lessons, and um, we talked about domestic violence, and we talked about masculinity um, more in a that he's, he's given to it, which is masculinities, and looking at it on a scale from um, being feminine all the way to toxic masculinity and that we actually climb and, and we, we navigate the scale based on safety and how vulnerable we feel at different times. Now, we really need to uh, do work on that. I'm actually scheduled tomorrow to talk about de um, redefining masculinity and, um, and, and and doing work on that. But does it mean because a molestation happened, and particularly for me, by a man that, um, that does something to my sexuality or names my sexuality, what does that mean for me? You know, um, and uh, the work of the Father Factory is really about like, let's take and let's wor work through those beliefs um, that are out there, those narratives that uh, people in the world give you, and then think about your personal narrative. And then let's, let's constitute that with what is God's narrative concerning us? What are we going to believe? What are we going to accept that will help us to uh, navigate the things that we've experienced? So, um... We're, we're, we're in our last uh, stretch here, yeah. and um, uh, I'm also um, seeing that there are questions about uh, other family members, uh, spouses, and um, uh, children of fathers. And so there are questions about how do you feel spouses can best support their loved one who have experienced childhood sexual trauma? And, you know, maybe... <laughs> Maybe there are signs there too that um, the spouse may be able to learn to listen to. Um, how wh what would the best kind of support look like, Hassan? You know, when when um, a, a man has not disclosed that this has taken place, oftentimes that man looks like the man that people are like, "What's wrong with him? He's got a problem. Something's happening, right?" And um, but when he does disclose, the recommendation is to believe him and to love him. Um, as he is ready to um, talk about what that experience is, um, don't sensationalize it, right? Um, it, it is what um, Chris, um, um, I'm getting his name, uh, Chris um, Anderson, the executive director for um, Male Survivor says, he says this, and it's really key, that um, trauma is sustaining an injury. And if we could stop and think about trauma as a sustaining an injury, then we don't fascinate it, right? We don't look and say, oh, this happened to you and, oh, and, and uh, by another man? And, and what does that mean? And how does this look to you still like me? Like, I, I remember being in a meeting with a client, uh, he and his wife, and she just, he disclosing, 
And she, you know, flat out said it in really bad terminology, but asked them, so this is this me, you're gay? And, but she said the words that we don't even um, dare to think of even. But um, it, it blew me away that, wow, you knew that he was coming to deal with some issues. Um, and um, and we, we take this and we look at it in a way that says, yeah, this is a bigger issue than anything else. And we, we fascinate it. Uh, so if you believe him and love him, allow him to talk about it as he's ready to do so. If you are working with men who have experienced this and they haven't been ready to talk about this, um, this create an environment that it's okay to hurt. Create an environment that it is okay to experience something um, that um, you don't, they may not know others have experienced, but it's it's okay. And it's an injury. You sustained an injury. This is something that you didn't ask for, you didn't um, wait for, you don't deserve. They need to feel that and understand that. And that needs to play out in our social work. And that needs to play out in our mental health um, uh, work that we do all across the board. So one of, one of the questions um, that I think um, gets to both sides of the support that a spouse can provide is how do you get to the point where you can let a, a partner or even your children know? And um, you know, I think a lot of the focus is on some sort of internal process for the father, uh, but I think you're touching also on what does the father need to feel is the readiness or the likelihood of a, a supportive response that doesn't sort of fixate and, as you say, fascinate on, um, on, on this, this part of um, the father's childhood experience. Yeah, I think from a, a, a survivor's point of view, and if they're looking to disclose, they should be ready for what may come out um, and know that that does not define the love that their, their um, spouse or their family has for them. Everyone's entitled to their expression of uh, what they will feel and what they will actually uh, go through. Um, what you uh, want to also think about is that, um, how do I explain it in a way um, that gives them a sense of where I am now versus what I've experienced? Um, and that's important because uh, you are, you can talk to victims and they will talk to their families and it, they may have experienced this as children and people are still looking at them in that light, like today, like it just happened and, um, and kind of treating it to that extent. But there's been some evolution that has actually happened to help this person work through a number of things. Thank you so much, Hassan. I, I think we, we can maybe sneak in one um, last um, question. And actually, it wasn't a question. It was really just an appreciation um, for the way in which you've brought spirituality into this work. And um, I think that that would be um, a really important um, uh, place for us to stop on for today. I, I thank you. I knew I could not do this work if I could not bring my faith to it. I see much. I've done those who work. I've done case management. And I know that that was the one aspect that we did not deal with. We dealt with everything else, but we did not deal with what's going on with your spirit. How are you broken? And how do we do the repair for that? And so um, I appreciate that comment and that, and that thought. And this is what drives the work that I'm doing now. So thank you for that. Can I say one last thing? I'm, I'll sneak it in real quick. Of course. <laughs> the, the very last thing I'll say is this, is that if we're doing this work, we want to do this work. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to promise that you will not make assumptions with doing this work with anyone that discloses to you that they've experienced childhood molestation. Don't make assumptions. For men particularly, this is one of the reasons why they will not disclose. Because if they say, this happened to me, then they uh, will get assumptions around this. And so, you know, don't assume, particularly don't assume you know why this, what this person is traumatized by. The thing you should ask is this question, what about that experience traumatized you? If you wanna to get to the core of the work 
and really work at the area that really um, devastated them, ask that question when they're ready to talk, like, what about that traumatized you? Now, they can say everything. That's fine. But you might be surprised that somebody will say, for, in my experience, and, and what I would say to this question is um, the, the, the distrust, like, this was a person that everyone trusted and put their faith in, basically, and you're just dropped. And you the disbelief that you would even go for something or be caught up in something like this. And then at that place is where you want to start doing the work. So yeah. well, that, that that is um such an important uh, thing to leave us with because uh, assumptions take away. Uh, the power and the control to define oneself. And um, that's the experience of being violated too, is the loss of control over defining oneself. So um, thank you for reminding us to listen without assumptions. Thank you for um, this uh, really important conversation and the really important work that you do. We will be sending out uh, links to your website with our email to everybody who registered. That email will be coming out tomorrow. And we hope that you'll come back for more Conversations for Change in 2021. In the meantime, come back tomorrow for our uh, webinar on doing the work you do online with the families that you serve. And uh, go to the BrassandTouchPoints.org website to find out more about our other webinars, including the strength-based family engagement webinars, which you can also sign up for at browsersandtouchpoints.org. Just click on the webinar tab. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan, and thank you all for joining us uh, and for the work that you do. Stay safe and stay strong. Bye.